Hi everybody, welcome to this Timeline documentary. My name is Dan Snow and here I am in a Lancaster bomber cockpit, one of the few remaining Lancasters from the Second World War, to tell you about my new history channel. It's called History Hit, it's like Netflix for history. Hundreds of history documentaries on there and interviews with many of the world's best historians. Follow the information below this film or just search online for History Hit and make sure you use the code TIMELINE to get a special introductory offer. Now enjoy this show. This is Poole Harbour in Dorset, one of the largest natural harbours in the world. Today it's a haven for waterborne pleasure seekers, but archaeologists believe that 2,000 years ago this was a very different place. An international port that traded as far as the Mediterranean, and at its hub, this apparently insignificant island tucked away in a corner. Why? Because Green Island, where I am now, has produced some remarkable archaeological finds coins, masses of pottery, including high-status foreign wear, and evidence of iron smelting and shale working. So far, so good. But this island has never been thoroughly excavated. And if we're going to prove it was the Dover of its day, we're going to have to come up with something much more substantial. And as usual, we've got just three days to do it. If there were a port in Poole Harbour 2,000 years ago, why on an island? And why a small blob so far from the main channel? The questions were raised three years ago when 40 test pits were dug all over the island, revealing imported pottery and hinting at foreign trade. But the test pits were too small to find structures. Now time team has come here to investigate the theory that Green Island is archaeologically rather special. How many times on Time Team have I said this could be a real significant archaeological site and we've ended up with a couple of post holes or a bit of Roman road? Are we really likely to be able to prove that this place was an Iron Age port? I think we've got a lot better chance with this one because of the finds that have already come from the place. I have to say, at first glance, these finds don't look particularly spectacular, Thank do they? You. So why are you showing us these four paltry shirts? <laughs> Because of the mix of material, we've got imports and native wares covering the 1st century BC into the 1st century AD. Things like this Samian coming from southern France, we've also got northern French wares. Now all that's coming in and being found in association with what we can date as Iron Age wares are being made locally. Now these look like proper finds. They're what, fascinating. what on earth are they? One of the big manufacturing industries on the island was shale working. That is the blank, that is the waste product of making a shale armlet. Oh. It's lathe worked and it's pre-Roman, so it's very unusual to find them using a lathe for this type of work before the Romans arrived here. But we're going to have to find more than a few bits of pot and a blank off an armlet, aren't we, if we're going to prove that this place was a major port? Yes. I mean, we need more material to start with so we can see what sort of range of material. We need more evidence of the industrial activity that was going on. Why industrial? I thought we were looking for a port, not industry. Because this sort of stuff is, is probably, you know, high status of valuable objects. They're making it here. It's presumably then going out. Exactly. It's not being left here. We don't find the finished article here at all. Mm. It's ending up elsewhere. Any other clues that we can look for? The big thing that I'm hoping to get out of this week is structural evidence, whether they're warehouses, manufacturing areas, hearths, kilns, that type of thing. So where do we dig? Well, we're going to do some geophysics in the open areas on the island anyway, but as a result of the test bits that Eileen's dug, we've already got a couple of areas that we can start putting a trench in already. God, that was a tough one. Down. An Iron Age port might have had wharves and docks, but if there were any on the shores of Green Island, they've long since gone, eroded by the sea. So instead, we're searching the interior for evidence of trade, such as foreign pottery, and industry producing more than was needed locally. We've targeted two areas, Trench 1 near test pits which reveal domestic debris, can fill fine settlement, and a second area here, where Eileen found worked shale and iron slag. Could this be where exports were manufactured? 
Time Team doesn't often dig on islands, and as you can imagine, getting us and the gear over here created quite a few larks, but once we're here, it's incredibly quiet and also very beautiful. There's loads of honeysuckle and mountain ash and chestnuts and these huge rhododendrons, which I think are going to create quite a few problems once we start digging. Uh, and there are a lot of ticks as well. Ah. <laughs> because of its ecology, the island's a triple SI, a site of special scientific interest. And that's going to create some practical difficulties. Mechanical diggers are out, so we've got to dig by hand. And we've got to keep the topsoil separate so that it can be restored when we backfill to preserve the ecology. A lot of the archaeology Eileen found was a metre down, so Phil and his army will have to shift a lot of spoil. And Geophys are also having to adapt to the terrain in their hunt for the industrial area. John, I have to tell you, there's been a certain amount of grumbling from your team about the fact that you're making them use such cumbersome equipment. It's actually because the archaeology is so deep here. We won't reach it with the normal instruments. Um, it's meant to be about a metre down. So this is ideal for sorting out that problem. What um, is that machine? Well, it's a magnetometer, the same as this. And what does it read? It reads magnetics. And so it will pick up ditches and metal working areas and pits and so on. All the sort of archaeology we expect here. It's just not very good where you've got low branches. I think we should stop talking and just watch Claire for a few minutes. It's good entertainment. Henry, our surveyor, is also getting tangled up in the island's vegetation. His GPS equipment doesn't work without a clear line of sight to a satellite. And Stuart, our landscape archaeologist, looking for telltale lumps and bumps which might say something about the island's past, well, he's just looking lost. But the good news is that already the archaeology is promising. We've barely scraped the surface in Trench 1 and late Iron Age finds are jumping out. Dash a meaty rim, isn't it, eh? That's, That's a serious part. piece of That's part, isn't it? Among Eileen's finds was a lot of worked shale. It's an easily fashioned oily rock which is found locally. Until recently, no one knew what to make of these rounds with square holes in them. For centuries, antiquarians looked at these and thought it was money, and they were given the name coal money. They thought it was the trading tokens that the Phoenicians brought over. Made out of coal? Made out of coal, exactly, the, the oil shale. And it wasn't until the 19th century that they looked at it again and looked at the working marks and realised that, no, something else is happening. How did they get these squares out of the middle? They'd use tools similar to these and hollow out the centre core. What's this extraordinary looking? It looks like a huge nut of a <laughs> massive 19th century industrial machine. That's a rough out for a bracelet. If this had continued to be worked, it would have been narrowed down and it would have ended up as a gorgeous black bracelet. Whenever we look at finds, there's always one on the table, which is so fantastic that I know it can't possibly have come <laughs> from our site. You are completely right. It's 1st century AD. It's a Romano British dog bowl, we call them. Um, this is from Egerton Hill in West Dorset, but we have a tiny shared of one from this site, again, excavated earlier this season. So we know that things like that were in existence here. And complete at one point. Eileen's belief that Green Island was a port, or part of a port, isn't just based on finds, but on a massive feature first identified three years ago. Two huge jetties in the channel between the island and the mainland. They're now under mud and only just visible at the very lowest tides. When they were originally found, it was thought that it was a continuous causeway really connecting Green Island really to the mainland. Mm -hmm. And they found, as Victor shown here, there's a 70 metre gap just at the deepest point, so shipping could presumably pass through the middle there, but it's not one continuous feature. What, what are they made of? These are a series of, of oak posts, about 25 centimetre diameter, with uh, sharpened ends which have been driven down uh, into the bottom of the harbour. And then we've got a whole series of Purbeck stone, limestone material that's been Crikey. dumped down and rammed mm. into that to make it really solid, almost like a sort of a harbour wall. John, do you know of anything else like this at all? I certainly can't think of anything along the Atlantic coast to find anything comparable. You'd really have to go to the Mediterranean world, to okay. the Greeks and the, uh, uh, and the Romans. What surprises me is the amount of investment that's gone into constructing so something like this. Yeah. The jetties have been dated to 250 BC. Although they could have been part of a port, as shown by Victor, they could equally have been defensive, 
either way, the question remains, what role did Green Island at one end of the jetties play? Back in Trench 1, Phil's already deep into the Iron Age, and at the rate he's going, he'll be in the Neolithic by nightfall. Phil, I've never seen you adopt a three-spade strategy in a trench before. Well, it's the, it's the best compromise to actually dig this trench, Tony. The, the fact is we've got a, about a metre of sand to go down through. But I thought archaeology was about layers. I thought that's why you used a trowel. That's if you can actually distinguish the layers. In this case, it is just sand. The layers, if they're there, are totally indistinguishable. So what we're doing is taking it down in a series of 10 centimetre spits. And the best compromise we can come up to is to shovel them off, the sand breaks up and we recover the pottery. And what we don't recover, we get out of the sieve And you can see the, the, the results of our strategy. Two nearly full trays of pottery from what? One and a half spits that we've dug off. That amount of pottery is from large scale settlement on this island. So we've got loads of finds, but we also want buildings. Can Geophys help? I've been trying to work out what I think's going on. We've only been able to do a sort of narrow strip because of all yeah. the trees and the vegetation, so it's only 20 metres by 50. And, but I think you can see these really clear anomalies coming through. And that's my interpretation. It looks like a series of enclosures. Mm, that's good, isn't that's it? That's excellent. Yeah. That's just what we're hoping for. I mean, I'd like to have a look at that junction there with a small trench. That's excellent. That sounds a good yeah. idea, doesn't it? Get the relationship between the two. But if I remember right, your test pit that had a bit of furnace material was approximately there. It was, yep. Well, if we did a trench to take in that old test pit, that would be great. the linear we've got, mm. and see what's going on. Yep. Why did you go, ooh, 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 when he said enclosures? What do you think we might find? Well, we were saying that we were interested in structures, weren't we? Exactly. And he straight away starts to look as if it's not just finds, but there's boundaries and buildings and Indeed, all this. Indeed, yep. Eileen's hunch that this area was promising seems to have been confirmed by Geophys, and we're putting in two trenches. Trench 2 is going into the area where Eileen found a bit of furnace and Geophys got a big spike. Could this be the furnace? And in Trench 3, we're targeting an enclosure ditch, which might show where settlement or workshops were. Archaeologists believe that a late Iron Age trading network extended all the way from Britain as far as India. Dorset was the territory of the Dura Treges, about whom little is known. They did build Maiden Castle, and in their territory was the biggest known port in southern Britain at Hengistbury Head, 25 miles from our site. But focus is now shifting to Poole Harbour because of the work Eileen has done here. On Fursey Island and the Oa Peninsula, there's extensive evidence of Iron Age settlement and industry. How could Green Island have fitted into a major port complex? It is a funny old place to have a port though, isn't it, Mick? I mean, you come from overseas, you drop the stuff off here, but then you've got to ship it over to the mainland Yeah, again. because it's on an island. Whatever you bring here or take from here has got to cross the water already, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, there may be an aspect of, uh, of defence uh, that we're looking at here. When we look at uh, some of the early trading sites in the Mediterranean, uh, occupied by the Greeks and, uh, uh, and the Phoenicians, places like uh, Cadiz, for instance, they're on islands, and so obviously you've got a certain amount of defence. The island seems to be stuffed with finds. We're finding them in the trenches, and now we're finding them on the beaches. Taking a break from his trench, Kerry spotted something intriguing falling out of the cliff on the northwest of the island. Pottery, flint, and something even more auspicious, our first sign of industrial activity. This looks more like iron slag or iron ore that you've got here. We've had iron slag from here before, and the big question really on Green Island is whether it's but sort of what stage in the iron making process does it relate to? I mean, basically, is it iron smithing? Basically, is iron coming into Green Island and someone's working it? Mm -hmm. Or are people actually taking the iron ore itself, putting it into a furnace, and actually producing metal here uh, in the first stages of production? That's what we'd really like to try and find out. And what's exciting about this really is that this slag here is not just slag, but it's also furnace lining. So we've actually got part of the furnace there. You can see the sort of clay which has been fired, and it's associated with flints and Iron Age pottery. There's a bit of black burnish ware there, which is from the Iron Age. Bits of furnace are probably falling out of the cliffs because 170 metres of the island have been eroded over the last 2,000 years. 
but if we can just trip over furnace lining, then this is fantastically promising for our search for industry on the island. We're also getting a sniff of industry from our trenches in what's now becoming known as Mosquito Alley, where in Trench 3, Matt is looking for a feature which Geophys thought might be an enclosure ditch. There's no sign of the ditch yet, but we have got our first shale core. Stuff here. We've got, it looks like a pit or something coming around here, um, but best of all, down there we've got a shale core. Hey! Just, just turning up there, in, in, actually inside this pit. That's awfully small. Is that the interior diameter of, of, the, of the bracelet? It could have been a ring or another piece of ornamental jewellery. Oh, they were making a whole range of items. Including cups and different types of jewellery as well. Ah. Miles? Hello. I found something. Just a few metres away, Miles in Trench 2 is looking for evidence of metalworking, and he may already have hit pay dirt. Nice. What you got, Miles? Well, it looks suspiciously to me like some kind of furnace bottom. Aha, uh -huh. uh -huh. yes. Yeah. That's, that's a smithing half bottom, so that's, that's what you get at the bottom of the furnace. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier about smelting mm -hmm. and smithing. Well, that is the sm comes from the smithing stage. Once you've got your metal, yeah. you've started to work it and actually turn it into useful artefacts. All right. Does that so, mean that that smithing is taking place in this trench where it's come from? Then? It's that's... taking place somewhere in the vicinity. But it right. doesn't tell you exactly where it is. We can't be certain that it was taking place in the exact fine spot to well, it. What, what would tell you the exact well, fine spot if I find it sitting in the ground? Right. Well, the, the thing we really want to try and look at is hammer scale. Now, when you're working iron, mm -hmm. the outside surface tends to form this crust, and when that sort of falls off as you forge it, it sort of creates a oh, sort, so of, it sort of sparks, it sparks flying, off, flying no, everywhere, absolutely. Right, right. Right. And that, that, yeah. That's, that's yeah. called hammer scale. And the hammer scale tends to stay where it was right. made. So if we can identify areas with high concentrations of this, mm -hmm. then we can basically say that's where smithing was taking place. This is tantalising evidence that somewhere near this trench there was a blacksmith's workshop, which would be a major find. The search is now on for the structure itself, and of course any hammer scale would be good to find. Phil's getting very excited by what's coming out of Trench 1. Phil, is that just a scatter of stones or is it something more significant? This is definitely something more significant, Tony. Ooh. This is, is a pile of stones, but the important thing about it is it's actually got some shape to it. Look, there's a deliberate straight line along there, there's another one going out there. This is not just a pile of stones that have come down at random within the, within the hill wash. This is a deliberate pile of stones. And I honestly believe that we are looking at an Iron Age or Roman or British surface, just like you're sitting on a surface now, maybe 2,000 years old. Could this be a structure rather than just a path or a floor? I don't think it's, it's a structure, but I'll bet you there's a structure very, very close. Any more finds? That, I think, is our best piece of dating evidence. That is the core of a lathe-turned shale bracelet. Oh, ah. And the association of that with the, with the stones and all the pottery around it, I think, confirms that this pile of stones is Iron Age or Roman of British. Mick, has anything like this been found on the island before? No, nothing like this has turned up, and it's exactly the sort of thing, structural thing, that we've been looking for. We said we wanted a profusion of finds. Looks like we've got a profusion of finds. We said we needed structures. We may well have structures. But does it mean we've got a port? Join us after the break. Beginning of day two. And once again, we're about to disturb the peace and tranquility of Green Island here in Pool Harbour as we try to find out whether it was once a thriving Iron Age port. In our effort to get to grips with what was happening on the island 2,000 years ago, we've got three trenches open, each targeting a different key feature. In Trench 1, Phil's trying to find out whether his pile of stones is the first structure ever found on Green Island. On the way, he's finding more shale cores. We know that metal was being worked on the island and some of that evidence has come from Trench 2. What Miles wants to find is the furnace itself. But so far this morning, all we've had out of the trench are shale cores. Ta-da! Perfect. Miles, well, look, I've got another one. Wow, that's lovely. That's complete. If this was a port, the island would have been crisscrossed by enclosure ditches, and that's what Matt's hoping to find in Trench 3. But guess what? 
Is that more? Rough oak for a shale bracelet. The manufacture of highly prized shale armlets and jewellery was obviously happening all over the island, probably for trade. Jake Keane is going to attempt to make a replica Iron Age armlet. Though shale's easy enough to work and polish with modern power tools, it's altogether a different matter with the tools available 2,000 years ago. So what are you going to do to get your bracelet out of it? Select your lump, split it, and then uh, see how you go from there. Show me how to do that then. OK, let's have a go. God, it does smell a bit, doesn't it, really? Yes, that's the oil it's... in it. Oh, look at that. Let's scribe this. Yeah. That's about your size, all right? You reckon? Have you ever seen this done before, Sean? I haven't, no. It's, uh, <laughs> I mean, you dig these things up and you think, well, I know what this is, but you don't really, because until you've actually seen it being made, it's, uh, oh, it, it just brings the whole thing to life, really. Some funny old stuff, isn't it? The other key industry that we're trying to bring back to life is ironworking. And in Trench 2, they think they may be closing in on the Iron Age furnace. Ratchet, suddenly we're digging big holes in the middle of the trench. What's this? But it's quite exciting, really, because um, we sectioned this feature off to see whether it would be going down. Yeah. And I uh, found this really nice vertical edge here. So hopefully it's part of the furnace. How can you tell the difference between here and, and, and here? Because it looks exactly the same colour to me. It's more by feel, really, because this is very loose. Can we speculate what this might be to do with the furnace yet? Not yet. <laughs> it's early days yet. If this does turn out to be part of an Iron Age furnace, it'll be the first one ever discovered in situ. Brilliant though that would be, it won't tell us why they were smithing iron on an island. But how much of an island was it 2,000 years ago? Green Island is quite a small island now, but was it like that in the Iron Age? No, it wasn't. It would have been larger if you drain the water down to about two metres below its present level, which is probably where it was, the sea level was. How do you know it was two metres lower in the Iron Age? There was a, a Roman site just on the north side of Brown Sea, which indicates the water level must I have see. been about that sort of level. Our site was part of a much bigger island that took in Brown Sea and Fursey Islands. Present-day Green Island was the bit that was closest to the navigable channel. But frustratingly, we can't look for wharves or quays or other direct evidence of a port because they're not there anymore. About 170 metres of quay seafront near the jetty are now underwater because of erosion and rising sea levels. We're finding industry because we're digging in areas that were well inland. How's Phil's structure coming on in Trench 1? There is good news and bad news, really. Yeah. You remember last night, we had a big spread of stones? All the way over here, That's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, they are the stones that's on the spoil tip behind you now. Oh, yeah. Firstly, there are quite a number of flint nodules. I think that these nodules are the raw material to make the tools to work the shale. We've also got plenty of examples of work shale. We've actually got a shale working site. The other stones are this, this very coarse iron stone. Now, they break this up to include in their pottery to actually temper the pottery. We've also got pottery making as well. And I think that what we were looking at was a dump of raw material. So when I was trying to push you about whether this was a structure or not, hang on, it's got a mosquito on you, and you refused to be pushed, actually you were right, there wasn't a structure here. I didn't think there was. But we do now have a structure. Look at this superb series of pitch stones running right the way across. Also, look how different the soil is on this side. See, it's got all these bits of stone to on this side, where you've actually got much darker material with quite a lot of bits of charcoal. So what does that imply that this is? That implies that this is a deliberate edge, possibly a terrace, some form of revetment. Perhaps, perhaps this is at, at, the, at the edge of a building. I, that I don't know. So though we've lost one possible structure, we've gained another more definite one. We're ahead. We've got four trenches open, producing a flood of finds. And now the archaeologists want to open another. Geophys have been sent into this area in the middle of the island. But they're going to have to hang on a tick. 
I imagine that the most useful implement on the island would be this, but it's not. It's this. It's a tick tool, and uh, I don't know if you can see this little black dot there. That's a tick. And what you have to do is you press the tool into the flesh along here, run it all the way up there, like that, and then turn this thing round anti-clockwise 180 degrees, like that. Dead as a doornail. But if you think I've got ticks, it's nothing compared with Geofizz. How many ticks do you reckon you've had between you in the last day or so? I think about 36, but I'm not showing you where. <laughs> so why have you got this poor masochist into this part of the island? <laughs> it's because we now have an opportunity to investigate this meadow area that hasn't been looked at by anybody before. But we know from the test pits that we've dug just down the slope there, it all seems to be centred on this area here. This could be the hub of all the activity. And the main thing about this area from our point of view is we're confident there's been no bonfires, no burning of the rhododendrons, no rubbish pit, so hopefully a, a clear area for us. And hardly any trees. Yeah, and no ticks, I hope. John Gator's not only having to contend with what's lying underground, but what's on the ground. They're acting as if they own the island. Well, actually, they do. I can see you're enjoying your lunch, but I'm afraid I'm going to have that. Ask if you could move, if you don't mind. Would we mind moving? Jo Davis has owned the island for over 20 years. She's keen to safeguard the beauty and tranquility of the place. Unless you want to do the GFIs for me. Whoa. Yeah. That would be fun. Okay. You'd probably get better results. <laughs> the family has never allowed anyone to explore this close to their house before. In Trench 2, the archaeologists were very excited about the feature they thought might be a furnace. Miles? Hello. Um, your furnace feature looks remarkably square. It is, isn't it? It's almost exactly uh, one metre square. Why is that? Well, it is a funny thing, Tony. Um, it's very rare in British archaeology when you dig a feature, are you able to say who dug it, uh, when they dug it, and for what reason? And we can say all three things here. Which is? Um, it was dug uh, about four months ago. Um, we know the names of the people who dug it, and uh, we know it's an archaeological test pit. <laughs> it's the one of Eileen's test it, it is, it is. We were fooled, essentially, at the beginning, of the fact that there's one or two Iron Age uh, pieces of pottery contained within the fill. But presumably you've still got a bit of something here. There is. We've still got this, this patch of clay, and you can see it in section here. So it is, this is actually something archaeological, so we can still investigate this. The good news is that there still might be a furnace in this trench, and we've still got time to dig it. 20 metres away, Matt in Trench 3 is looking for an enclosure ditch and has come down onto natural geology that, unusually for Time Team, can be easily seen. I've got down to the natural in this trench. This is the yellowy sand we can yeah, see. Yeah, it's yellowy sand. Yeah. It gets a bit mottled, but it's all the same stuff. Right. But we eventually did find a feature, this ditch across the side here, yeah. full of this dark material. It's plunging right down, Absolutely, isn't yeah. It? You can see the yellow sand gets to the edge and then straight down like that. But clearly you haven't got room to move there, have you, really? No, we haven't even reached the bottom of it yet. It's still going down. So. Yeah, so I think probably we ought to come, a, what, a metre this way? Yeah, I thought you might say that. <laughs> Away from Trench 1, Phil's learning how to make an Iron Age shale armlet. He's chiselling out the basic shape from a lump of shale. Jake, this is getting awfully fragile. I, I mean, I think I'm pretty much through there, aren't I? You're very nearly there, yes. You could tap it off, but I wouldn't. I'd, I'd chip it through, because what we don't want is bits of this broken. Ah. The shale's now ready for turning on the ingenious foot-driven wood lathe to be shaped by flint tools napped by Phil himself. One area we seem to have ignored is the open hillside. Following Geophys results, which indicated burning, we put trenches four and five in here. But they only revealed burnt rhododendrons and stones, neither of which advance our story much. But geophys have persisted and now have more results from this area as well as for the meadow and the lawn, both previously off-limits to archaeologists. Are there targets there and will we be able to dig for them? Right, here's the last key area, I hope. Now, so where, where have you done? Where are Show we us now? Here. We've got the one area here on oh, the lawn. That's where we're sitting now on the lawn. Yes. Uh, and then the one area in the long grass which we had cut. Right. Yeah. Uh, and look, ignore these modern 
responses, but we've got a mass of anomalies. These could all be to do with metalworking. Really? Uh, and then in the, the sort of scrub area to the right, um, other anomalies, are, I mean, lots of targets you could go for. Uh, and look, there is Trench 5. We're well clear of all the modern disturbance now, and we've got a mass of responses I'd like to look at. I think we should certainly do more work based on that yeah. at the bottom of the we slope. We need to keep looking there as well. Have yeah. you done any test bits here? In this area? No, I mean, this area's always been sort of out of bounds to us as far as digging goes. So, if we were able to persuade Joe that it maybe shouldn't be out of bounds for the rest of today <laughs> or tomorrow. Sounds like a job for you. How very easy it is. And maybe sometime. Right. <laughs> He's done it before, he's good at it. Let's hope so. Joe! <laughs> has anyone shown you this? No. Uh, look, that is very, very interesting. Really? Ideally, what we'd like to do is put in a little test pit to uh, to see what it is. There, there, right. there's, a, there's a slight problem. It's on the lawn. What, here? Yeah, yeah, I'll show you where it is. It's just, just about here, it would be it, one metre square. In all honesty, there would be a line there for a couple of months, but it would grow over and you wouldn't notice. It would be just the same as the rest of the lawn. Whatever happens, even if we find something, we limit ourselves to that one metre. Mick? Mick? Yeah? Can you guarantee that it'll only be one metre square? Yeah, just one metre test bit would be really useful. Would that be OK? It'd be very, really useful. I suppose so. OK. God, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> there are going to be three new trenches, each looking for possible industry indicated by Geophys. Trench 6 is on the lawn and Trench 7 in the meadow area nearby. We've opened Trench 8, our final stab at investigating the open hillside more in hope than expectation. In Trench 1, Phil's line of stones is looking ever more like a building. We've got this cracking uh, front uh, of pitch stones, and they are trending round in an arc. And then, uh, what you can see, about three quarters of a metre back beyond that, we've literally got a, a parallel set of mm -hmm. stones going round. I mean, it looks to me like the sort of thing you get at the back of a house. If we could show this was actually some sort of settlement, you know, domestic buildings exactly. and so on with domestic yeah. debris, that would be a major step forward, wouldn't well, it? Well, exactly I mean, we've, we've, we've got oyster shells, we've got bone. So you've got the stuff well, you how, find how, how on much, a house rather than a workshop. I was going to say, yeah. how, well, we've, we've, we've got a lot of workshop debris, yeah. shell workshop yeah. debris, but we do have domestic refuse. Well. You know, if we can get the post holes and things to go with that's it, that's right. going to be fantastic, isn't it? Very good. Trench 2 has had its ups and downs. In the search for a furnace, we found one of Eileen's test pits. But we're still hoping that Miles can deliver something 2,000 years older and a lot less square. Miles, it's changed again. What's this extraordinary round thing? Uh, it's something that's not a test pit. We've got this big sort of oval spread here of baked clay, and all the way around it, we've got these pieces of daub, and you can see the wattle marks in there, which is all, all part of this sort of structural material. So what do these two things mean? Well, it's, it's the whole thing, really. I mean, that's come up where we found the slag finds yesterday, where we found the smithing hearth bottom. Yeah. We've gone in with the magnet again today, and we've got hammer scale coming up here now in higher proportions. So the association of the smithing hearth bottom, the slag, this wide burnt area, and this structural daub seems to suggest what we could actually have there is a smithing hearth. So we've definitely got smithing here. The one thing that I'm really interested in was this thing you had your foot on. Yes, that? yeah, well, that, that's... Uh, can't be too certain at the moment, but. It, it seems that it might well be the base for the anvil. How often do you come up with these kind of things? These aren't sites aren't to a penny. Uh, if you look uh, across on the mainland, um, most I know sites have been badly damaged by ploughing. And I really can't think of any example, no. which is certainly as well yeah. preserved as this. We might be able to get some detail out tomorrow to say not just that it is a furnace, but actually what sort of furnace it is, how it worked, how the actual act of uh, smithing was practised. So we're looking at something that's pretty unique. I would say it is unique, yes, totally. But is it industrial? And can we find any more of it? And when we get down deep inside it, what else will we find? Join us after the break. Beginning of day three in our search for an Iron Age port here at Green Island in Poole Harbour, and our trenches are really starting to come up with the goods. In Matt's trench, we've got what appears to be an Iron Age ditch, probably second century BC. This is my favourite trench. We've got a furnace here. We've got bits of a wattle and daub wall. We've got what appears to be part of an anvil. And you want to extend now, don't you, Miles? God, yes, yeah. We've only got uh, two-thirds of the feature, really, in, in, the, in our trench. We really need to get all this out. 
out and get the whole thing in plan. Big square here. Definitely. But that's not all. 30 metres away in Phil's trench over there, he's got a big line of stones which he thinks might be part of an Iron Age roundhouse. So he wants to extend that trench too. And we're putting in a new test bit over there because of some of John's geophys. We've already put in a test bit here, slap bang in the middle of the lawn because another one of John's spikes. And through the trees, we dug a trench yesterday, which we're still finishing. And we've got a brand new trench there as well, which is a heck of a lot of new trench for day three. So the pressure is on. Our key targets are the Iron Age industry that went with the port, metal smithing and shale working, as well as evidence of settlement. Next to Phil's roundhouse, he's now found cracking evidence of human occupation, bone. The only bone we've had has come from a waterlogged deposit. We've had nothing from the dry soil like this. Is that because the sand is so acidic exactly. that it's actually yep. destroying the bone? Yep, it's heathland soils and it degrades everything that's in there. So these pieces of bone are potentially really them. important. Do you know what sort of um, species it is? I'm not absolutely certain, but it looks mostly cattle to me. I think that's great because that matches exactly the type of bone pieces that we were getting from the waterlogged deposit, which was cattle, sheep, also a bit of duck, but it's all animal that was very good eating. So that is really good new information about the people that Absolutely. were living here. In Trench 2, they've drafted in John Gator to check whether they found an anvil and whether there was more than one furnace here. That's definitely the only polyfired stone. There's nothing else around that at all that's, that's giving a high reading. No, average readings. It is an anvil, but just the one furnace. Chief Apprentice Phil is tied up in his trench, so the apprentice's apprentice has come to lend a hand at our shale works. They're trying to carve the inner core out of the armlet. It just tend to wander, doesn't yes, it? That, that, what I'm trying to do at the moment is get that groove in the right place. Okay. How long is it going to take to uh, well, carry on like this? I reckon you've got two or three hours. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> So that's the rest of mixed day sorted then. Back in trench one, D seems to be breaking all the rules of good trench keeping in pursuit of a huge lump of shale in the section. Oh my God, it is going, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, I think it's going a bit far really for us to continue doing this. No, I, still I, don't, I mean, we've got, we've got to get it out. I don't care, I, I don't yeah. care how big a hole you, you have to You want me to do. just go for I don't it? Care. You, you, we, we, we can't afford to lose that big piece. Good well done. You want to put it straight in there? Yes, please. This huge piece of shale would have been the raw material for making an armlet. God, that is a big old piece, a big isn't, piece it? isn't it? The archaeologists have never before been allowed to dig near the house in the middle of the island. We're hoping that trench six in the lawn and seven in the meadow will give up more of the island's secrets. Dan, have you found whatever it was that caused the geophysics spike here? No, not yet, but um, nowhere near the bottom, I don't think. But look at this. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. That's, That's Samian, nice. presumably. That's Samian, yep. Uh, late first, early second century. That's your import. Okay, coming. Do you want to have a look? Let's go. You know, we were talking about just how well preserved the bone yep, was. Yep. Who would have thought amongst that well preserved bone, two fragments, a yep. human skull? Look. Definitely. There are the sutures where the plates are all joined together. We're 99% certain that is human yep. skull fragments. Yep. Do you think it was just discarded here, or do you think it could actually be part of a burial? No, I mean, it's not unusual to get fragments of, of human remains in Iron Age features. But was it on the surface or in a cut or anything? Well, funnily enough, if you look down in the bottom of the hole here, the bones came from right down in the bottom, in that black stuff. Yep. But you notice there is this very, very white-coloured sand, the natural That's sand. Natural, yeah. But it looks like we've got a, a possible ditch or a shallow feature running through the middle of the test bit. It's early days yet, but yep. we could well have a, a ditch with the human bones in it, yep. predating 
this, this stone-built structure. But Phil, if there's a ditch in front of the wall, does that reduce the chance that we've actually got an Iron Age hut? Not at all. It may even actually increase it. This could be the foundation slot, the actual foundation trench in which the building stood that fell down, and then at a later stage it got filled up with domestic rubbish and bits of bone. The bees are busy, the diggers are busy, all over the island, there's the steady scrape of spade on sand. At our own industrial site, after endless grinding of the shale armlet, a critical moment approaches. First apprentice Phil has had to drag himself away from his trench for this crucial operation, breaking the armlet away from the core. Oh, yes! Hey, look, 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 stop! Look, I can what see daylight. Look, there it is. I can, I can, see, see, I can see him. <laughs> <laughs> if the armlet's broken, hours and hours of scraping and polishing will all go to waste. Yes. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Do you reckon that fit your hand? Uh, you might get your head through there. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little further down the hillside, Trench 8 was opened to look for the source of a geophys hotspot. It's produced some flint, more shale cores, and uniquely some charred grain, which suggests people were living near here. In Trench 3, Matt has now revealed his Iron Age ditch. Yeah, really steep sides going right yep. straight down like that. And did you get any finds or anything from it? Yeah, a few bits. They've turned out to be mainly late Iron Age, I think. Yep, I think so. Late Iron Age forms and fabric. Splendid, mm. lovely. This ditch might have been enclosing a shale works or even some of the huts where the workers lived. But our best evidence of settlement has been Trench 1, which has constantly surprised us. Just when we thought we could confirm that it contained an Iron Age roundhouse, it's delivered yet another twist. And this time, it's not altogether welcome. So has it turned into a roundhouse then, Phil? No, it's more of a rectangular straight one, Mick. Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we wanted at all. No. Well, look, it's supposed to come around, at least curving round like that. Yeah. And I think it's, it's more or less coming through there. What I'm wondering is whether or not this one here, look, is a, is a terminus. Look, see that oh, big yes, white one? yes, yeah. Whether or not that's some sort of a... Yeah. Well, yeah, a wall that stops there. Yeah. It don't seem... We haven't got any big stones here, none of the pitch ones, and on this side. Right. But that's it ain't round. I mean, one tends to think of sort of Roman if it's straight, and, you know, Iron Age well, means that's round. The sort of, that's the sort of golden <laughs> rule, isn't it? Yeah. Curved Iron yeah. Age and Roman straight ones. Yeah. It's poor old Victor I feel sorry for. Why is that? What he drew it as a round. <laughs> <laughs> so Victor's gone back to the drawing board. But the archaeologists can't agree on what we've found, although it's still possible that it's part of a building and that it's Iron Age. One thing we do know, this could have been the area where workers lived and kept their raw materials. In Trench 2, they desperately want to reveal the Iron Age furnace that was part of the smithy before the end of the day. These strange circular things weren't here last night. What are they, Mark? Well, it's some sort of structure related to the hearth, so it could be a, a set of bellows or something. How would that work? Well, what we think is going on here is, is in these two pits here would have some sort of ceramic vessel and perhaps on top of that tied around it a sort of leather bladder or something which they'd have pumped up and down to force the air into oh. the furnace. Oh, I thought he meant that they were like post holes and there'd be a big bellows like my mum used to have <laughs> strapped to it. <laughs> not, not, probably not in the iron nose, no, no. Roger, this bit here has always intrigued me. What we can see there is a dump of fresh clay which is being used to repair the furnace as it literally melts. And it leaves behind stuff like we found in there. Absolutely. So it's like a little emergency pile yes. in case things start it's going It's a first aid kit for failing furnaces. So what does this trench tell us about the industry that was going on here? Well, I mean, the key thing is we've actually found the structures relating to, to this activity. Before we just had the artefacts, we've had the sort of bits of slag, we've had all kinds of bits of shale in the, in the surface. Now we've actually got a firm evidence of a structure that's showing us that they're, they're smithing this iron, they're actually creating objects and this is one of the, the key structures. It's definitely smithing. It is. And you think that the fact that they were doing it on an island is in itself special? I, I, I think what you've got here is a, a very special process. Remember, this is the Iron Age. Iron's pretty new. It's a novel material, yeah. and it's used for really sort of prestigious uh, objects. Mm. So I think there's special people doing special things, and they would have been seen as being special 
by other people. You're a bit skeptical about this idea yeah. of special, aren't you? I just wonder whether we aren't reading too much into it. I could see that originally the process would look magical, mm. you know, of getting metal out of stone, but we're well on into the Iron Age here. It must have been much better known yeah. than, than it had uh, been. I, I agree to an extent. I think we have to remember is basically most people weren't ironsmiths. Mm -hmm. OK, so, you know, this is a pretty rare thing to be doing compared to the rest of the people. Yeah. And yeah. what you do basically makes who you are. Who you are is down to what you do. Was this a place to be treated with awe and wonder, or just a workshop? What's beyond dispute is that Green Island has produced the first structure of an Iron Age furnace ever found in Britain. The iron would have been placed directly on charcoal, fanned by the leather bellows. Nearby, there would have been an anvil for working the metal. An Iron Age smithy might have made tools, such as chisels and hammers, or weapons, such as swords and knives, or just iron bars for trading. After three days hard digging, we've found no structural evidence of a port. What we do have are literally thousands of finds, and they tell a story of industrial activity and occupation on this island for 500 years. What we have got are about 30 bags cool. full like this of pottery, yeah. shale, slag. Far more than we normally get. Presumably most of this stuff's datable. Yes, I mean, we start off at this end with uh, the earliest stuff, which is about 250 BC. We go through to about 100. Here, we're getting up to about the time of the Roman conquest. But then we've got occupation, which goes on into, into the Roman period. So second century Samian, third century Roman coin, and quite a lot of other finds to go with that as well. For some inexplicable reason, the piece you're most excited about is this. Why? It's contemporary with when the jetties were constructed, so it populates the island right back about 250 BC. There were people here with those pots when they're building the jetties. And you didn't have evidence of that before we came? Not confirmed evidence such as you're holding in your hand. We've had a huge amount of this shale, haven't we? And loads of slag. But have we had very much of this imported work? We haven't really, Tony, no. We've had about 1% of the total collection. Which is significantly less than you were finding in your test pits. Much so, yeah. So doesn't this rather undermine the idea that we've got a big port here with lots of exports coming in? No, it doesn't worry me because we're only seeing one part of the, the total picture. Uh, Green Island is part of a much bigger complex. And over uh, on Oa, for instance, uh, there's a very much higher percentage of very exotic material which you just don't get anywhere else. Mick, what does this whole assemblage tell you? I think what it's telling us is that we've got to start thinking of Pool Harbour as some sort of, you know, big, not only Iron Age industrial centre, but, but probably another port that's of international importance we hadn't allowed for. So when I came here looking for a port, it wasn't that there isn't a port here, it's just that it was part of something much bigger. That's right. I think it's the whole of Pool Harbour itself. You did give me quite a hard time in those negotiations, <laughs> didn't you, before you let us dig this test bit? Not here. hard enough, really. <laughs> oh, come on, it is beautiful. And we didn't mm. extend it. It's a lovely piece of work, isn't it? Yep. And it was worth it because of the finds, which are quite spectacular. There's this uh, whiskey bottle. Right. That's probably mine. <laughs> what about the uh, glucose fizzy drink yes. bottle? <laughs> but thanks for mm. letting us dig it. And That's also, okay. thank you for letting us share your lovely island for three days. And by way of thanks, we would like to give you this. It's just like the bracelets that they made here 2,000 years ago. That's really beautiful. Thank you. I should treasure it. It's amazing to think what was happening on Green Island 2,000 years ago. There may well have been wharves here which have been lost to erosion and rising sea levels. But the island was undoubtedly an industrial site, a leading producer of shale ornaments and iron artefacts. Looking at it today, tranquil and cut off, it seems extraordinary to think that there would have been the hubbub of industry everywhere. It would have been a different world. But there would still have been ticks. <laughs> <laughs>